All right, evening, everybody. Um, just waiting uh, for at least two or three more persons to join the class before we begin.
Still waiting for at least two, two more persons to join us before I begin. All right, just waiting for one more person and then we begin, okay?
All right, evening students. I'm, I'm going to begin because Um, so I'm going to be camera off today because I'm not feeling too well. I feel like I'm coming out with flu. So I'm a bit nasal and all that kind of stuff. So it's best that I don't appear on camera for today's class. I'm going to share screen. Just not hearing it so clearly. I can ask you to repeat what you said, please. All right, hold on. Let me use my other earphone. I think this one is not mixed. It's not as clear as it should be. Give me a sec. Are you hearing me better now? Yes, sir. All right, so I'm saying that um, we're going to continue our discussion. No, I was saying earlier that I'm not feeling too well. I feel like I'm coming out with the flu. As a result, I usually I'm on camera, but not today. Um, we're going to continue our discussion uh, looking at international trade theories. And also today we have a presentation. Um, one person, at least two presenters are, are we have two presentations. So at um, eight o'clock, we are going to begin the presentations because I need for you, I one person to present and give enough feedback. Um, before time runs out and you realize that almost half of the, well, half an hour of the class has already passed. So it was not open high. So give me one sec. Let me just. I have too many things open. All right, so before I get go there, let's just look at where we are. So we're on the, we're look, discussing unit four, um, looking at these specific theories. So we have looked at mercantilism. We have looked at Smith's theory of absolute advantage. I introduced you to the concept of Ricardo's um, theory of comparative advantage. We're gonna to touch a little bit on that. And um, we're going to discuss as well, Porter's cluster theory. I don't know that time will allow us to look at the other theories. Um, we probably will delay, we might wrap that up on Friday. So use this week to wrap up the, all the discussions relating to um, international trade theory. And our objective, or our objectives include um, being able to examine the international trade theories, um, compare and contrast the different trade theories and look at them, looking at their advantages and disadvantages, which means just looking at their strengths and weaknesses. The important thing to note as well is how to use the tr these different trade theories to talk about international trade, whether they you think they are prescriptive or descriptive. Um, and some people say that either of, so almost all the theories can either be prescriptive or they can be descriptive depending on the point or the stance you're trying to prove. So think about it that way. Although you would think that a theory such as mercantilism is more descriptive because it speaks about the origins to some extent of international trade and how international trade was um, being done at a particular moment in time but it can also be seen 
in a sense of it being um, prescriptive, depending on what is happening in international trade or, or in international relations. And this is where they call it neo-mercantilism. And we see some of that with some countries, former President Trump, but you do have other countries who are like that who believe that, for example, the balance of trade must be positive for their country. Um, they don't want to have any too much of a trade deficit. The other thing I'll, I'll point out to you is that remember when you go to Canvas and you look at international business, you go to modules and the information relating to the different modules are there. So it's for you to just um, kind of go through some of the information because I would not, I will not be able to cover every single thing on the module as in depth as I would want. I'll cover all the topics, but I won't be able to cover it in a way where everything is um, where you're going to where I'm going to deep dive into every single thing. All right, and I'm just ensuring that all these things are published so that you have access to it. Something I must make note of, um, I must caution you against, do not just lift the information from the lecture slides, you must find the sources. All right, that's very, very fundamental. Um, and I, I, again, today I'll take some time to discuss academic writing. You know, how do you structure your academic paper? If I don't get a chance to do it today, we can do it um, at another time. But that also is important for today's um, presentation. I think we have two persons. Let me just remind myself who those persons are. So we have today is Javar and Kemar. So I know Javar is here already. I'm not seeing Kemar. And next week, no, those persons will look. Um, oh, mid semester is next week. So please remember, please note that mid semester is next week. We will just be multiple, multiple choice questions. Only multiple choice questions, okay? And then the following week, we pick back up with our presentations. I want to ensure that my, my dates are not off. Just want to make sure that my dates are not off. So Javar and Kemar um, are presenters for today. I'm hoping persons would have done some amount of, um, you yourself would have looked at the question, um, examine the roles international bodies play in international trade, because this could be an exam question. In your final exam, you will be given multiple choice questions as well as essay questions. All right, so it's important that you also um, prepare for each um, question because some of these questions are um, not necessarily in the same way, but they'll come back on the final exam. Any questions before I continue? All right, no. So last, in last class, we started a discussion about international trade theories. And we kind of help ourselves to understand theories as, um, as suppositions or assumptions about how things are done or why things are done. That's just a general um, overview or, or a definition, quote unquote, of um, theories. And then in the context of international trade, we do have, um, for the course, we do have two, let's say two types of theories that help, that help us to understand international trade. So we do have theories that 
tell us or helps us to understand why nations trade. And these are called classical theories, mercantilism, absolute advantage, comparative advantage. We Factor promotion theory is not a part of what we're supposed to look at an international product life cycle. Yes, that's a theory that is on the syllabus, new trade theory, as well as on um, the course outline. The other type of um, international um, trade theories help us to understand how nations enhance their competitive advantage as they participate in international trade. We have competitive advantage, which is not necessarily a theory that we need to look at, but a discussion about it is also important just to understand what countries do to gain competitive or to gain an um, to gain a competitive advantage, how they create a kind of atmosphere for companies within their country to become um, to gain competitive advantage um, through innovation and research and development and things like that. Then we must look at Michael Porter's diamond um, model, which really is cluster theory. This is a theory that I've actually I actually um, it's a theory that is not just unique to um, international business, but it's a theory that helps us to, that is also used in other areas. So when I was, for example, teaching about culture, um, looking at culture within a creative industries lens, or um, the cultural and creative industries, we also looked at cult, um, cluster theory. That's another name for cluster theory, and how that helps us to understand um, why some in certain parts of the world we have clusters of businesses and how that actually helps them to gain a competitive advantage so those are the ones that really relate to us the other one we can look at the foreign direct investment based explanation um i'm almost sure that we have to look at the international internalization theory i we don't have to, so we don't have to look at these, the firm internationalization, and we don't have to look at these two types of theories. So we are more concerned with the nation level explanation theories relating to international trade. So this again gives us a sort of timeline in terms of international business theories over time. So we did talk about mercantilism, um, that, and it helps us to understand trade especially in Europe at a particular time. And then thereafter, because it was a theory that's because it's a theory that is that promotes the some sort of selfishness in the context or in the sense that it promotes um, exporting um, goods and well in at that moment um, goods to other countries, but limiting the imports from other countries. And of course that in and of itself um, is problematic because there it is it's a sort of protectionist approach. And we do have neo-mercantilist um, international trade happening even now in the sense that some countries, they do have a protectionist approach to some of their industries. They find creative ways to, pro to protect their industries by subsidizing farming or also increasing tariffs and quotas on particular goods coming into their country. And it was because of the quote unquote selfishness of how mercantilism um, not only described but prescribed international trade that absolute advantage came about because it came, it came as a response to mercantilism in saying that countries really should trade, it, trade with each other. They should actually open up trade, not be a situation where the country is, it should not be a situation where the country is actually um, actually wants to export like, to other countries, but does not want to import from other countries or, or restricts or, or increases um, um, tariffs and implement quotas. What absolute advantage says is you should just trade in an, um, trade goods and services that you have an absolute advantage in. The, we, we talked a little bit about, uh, about that and I'll just pick up there in terms of absolute advantage before we go into the other um, theories. And I was, I'm not sure why I came off what I was looking at because it was really giving us a trajectory. Then after now came the whole notion of comparative advantage, which is also a kind of response to that theory in the sense that not because you have an absolute advantage in 
um, this particular in two particular goods, it means that you should actually focus on those particular goods. Comparative advantage is really saying that you should really focus on the goods and services to some extent that you can gain a better advantage, not an absolute advantage, but a better advantage. So if, for example, um, Japan and, and um, America are producing two, um, let's say, planes and apples, it could be that Japan takes less, less time to produce the, to, to make a plane. And so let me get there before I kind of get into the, 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 the actual explanation, because sometimes comparative advantage is a little bit confusing for students, especially when you're then when you're going to talk about um, absolute advantage. So it just this just gives us a kind of trajectory in terms of international business series, um, theories or international trade theories in helping us to understand how and why countries trade with each other or, or um, with one another. So I'm not going to go back into discussing this, the theories that we, um, we discussed. I just wanted to give you a sense of where we stopped and where we are going now. So I'll start here with absolute advantage as a way to go into um, comparative advantage. So absolute advantage, a, a country has an absolute advantage in producing a good over another country if it uses fewer resources to produce that good. And we talk about the whole notion of efficiency. For example, extracting oil in Saudi Arabia is pretty much just a matter of drilling a hole. Producing oil in, in other countries can require considerable exploitation, exploration sorry, and costly technologies for drilling and extraction, if indeed they have any oil at all. In other words, um, Saudi Arabia has an absolute advantage because they it doesn't take much for them or it doesn't require a lot of energy, a lot of um, technology, and even money to extract um, oil. So they have an absolute advantage in that particular area. The, the United States has some of the richest farmland in the world, making it easier to grow corn and wheat than in, than in many other countries. So if the United States, for example, wants um, oil or there's a high demand for oil in his country and there's a high demand, for example, and Saudi Arabia, for example, um, there's a high demand for wheat and corn in Saudi Arabia because each country, is, each country has an absolute advantage. Um, Saudi Arabia with oil and the United States with, with corn and wheat, they should just trade with each other because it makes better sense. The same thing goes with, for example, countries like Guatemala and Colombia that have climates especially suited for growing coffee. I would include the Caribbean in that to some extent that we have absolute advantage because of our climatic conditions. Chile and Zambia have some of the world's richest copper mines, as some have argued geography is destiny. So Chile will produce copper and Guatemala will produce coffee and they will trade. So these countries, they know the goods that they have um, an, an absolute advantage in producing and therefore will sign multilateral agreements or bilateral agreements with one another and do trade. Usually when they, um, they sign multilateral or bilateral agreements, there are, um, within those agreements, you have sections that deal with um, court, with, 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 with um, quota restriction and with tariffs. And this, for example, why institutions such as the World Trade Organization becomes important because you need what I would want to call regulators. You, want, you need regulators, so, so the World Trade Organization sets the rules for trade in goods as well as the rules for trade in services. So you can see it as a regulator, but you can also see it as a promoter. The World Trade Organization is also there not just to regulate, but also to promote international trade between and among countries because it is in, in the interest of countries to actually trade because some of them are not able to produce the goods and or services that, that, um, that their country or that their citizenry need. And also to, you can think about it another way where they might be able to produce 
um, they might have an absolute advantage in two things, but it makes better sense for them to specialize in producing one over the other because the returns are better. So there's something called opportunity cost. So it's best for them to give up producing, um, for example, milk when they'll get more rewards in producing planes. So they say, okay, we will focus on producing planes and give up milk. What we'll do, we'll just um, import milk um, from other countries at a particular cost because it makes better sense for them. And we will export planes. And that's part of the whole notion of comparative advantage. Are we understanding so far? I just kind of going over so that I can place the other, the other theories within context. Are we understanding? Yes, sir, so far. Okay. So again, absolute advantage refers the, to the ability of a nation to produce a good more efficiently than other countries because of its superior resources. And we talked about those particular examples. It argues that a country should produce only those products in which it has a clear advantage or can produce using fewer resources than another country. So emphasis, emphasizes the absolute cost of production. So the focus is on the cost of production. So if I can produce it at a lower cost or I can get most, uh, I can get a lot, I can efficiently produce it more than you, then of course, it makes sense to focus on what I'm very good at and you should focus on what you're very good at and then we trade. So here's an example, labor days required for producing, uh, for labor days required for production. Um, can anybody tell me, can you, ex this, this diagram, how would you explain it within the context of absolute advantage? Or which country has, uh, has an absolute advantage? Um, let's see, Spain. Spain has an absolute advantage. All right, so how would you explain it? All right, so um, probably because uh, But then can like produce something more efficiently than Italy, I guess. Um, what are you using to determine that Spain is able to better um is able to better produce it or more efficiently produce it than Italy? Okay. Um as you guys said that um I mean like everybody might have like certain resources that Italy doesn't have and um we give them a better advantage of like producing certain stuff that they can use. Okay, yeah. so, so let me ask you this question again, and I'm speaking to the entire class. So remember the numbers here are speaking to what? Labor days required for production. In other words, the number of days it is, it number of days it would take to produce clothing in Italy and in Spain. The number of days, these two numbers represent the number of days. So which country has an absolute advantage in the production of clothing, if we're using this as um, as the point of reference. Rashid, al -Ray, what would you say? What, what, anything from you? Which country would you say has an absolute advantage in the production of clothing? Um, Venezuela, sir, because they make some- We're place. using, hello, sir, look at what we're doing. We're using these, are you seeing my screen? Yes, sir. We're talking about, we're using this particular, um, oh, oh, as I said, oh, okay. this is our point of reference. That one, it, oh, out of Italy and Spain, out of between Spain. Italy and Spain, which okay. one has an apps? Why do you say Spain? Because Spain has a lot of manufacturing companies. Um, Italy, a beast of Italy, Italy, a beast. Where do you see? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Do you see anything there about companies? 
No, the, sir. The only thing you're supposed to use to make a determination which one has an absolute advantage is the labor days required for production. In other words, the number of days it is, it, it is required to produce one piece of clothing. So which country has an absolute advantage? Oh, so Italy, sir, because the Italy will take um, two days to produce one set of clothing, so Italy. Exactly. So the absolute advantage would be Italy because it would take less time in Italy to produce um, one piece of clothing versus Spain. Right? So in other words, in a in a perfect world, probably Spain needs not to produce what? Clothing, they probably need to produce, focus on something else. So this is where the, the, the discussion or the, the, the conversation about specialization comes in. Um, someone could argue that Italy should specialize in, um, in the production of clothing because it has an absolute advantage in the sense that it takes less days um, to produce one piece of clothing, all right? So don't make the larger number fool you to believe that because then this number is larger, it means that that is the country that has the, um, the absolute advantage. What you have to pay attention to is the description at the top, labor days required for production. So less time is required to produce one piece of clothing in um, Italy versus Spain. So Italy has an absolute advantage in the production of clothing. Again, here's another example. So can you tell me, well, it's kind of there, but can you make sense of the table? Which country has an absolute advantage in the production of oil and which country has an absolute advantage in the production of corn? So for oil, that would be Saudi Arabia, corn, America, sir. All right. Can you explain how you arrive at your answer? So as um, you would have explained earlier that um, if the lease, um, so Saudi Arabia will take one day to um, produce one, to produce our America will take two days, right? Are you seeing days there? What What is the description they are using? What is the description they are using or the descriptor? in terms of production. It's there, people, it's, it's right there. Always, always, sir, always. Right, always. So uh, so explain yourself again. Sorry, so Saudi Arabia will take one, um, that's it, that's one hour per barrel, that's if I explain that right, while America will take two hour Barrel, right to produce uh, oil you have to remember you have to give it full so, so for to produce one barrel of oil it would take Saudi Arabia one hour um, but it would take two hours it would take America two hours to produce one barrel of oil all right let's talk let's talk to us now about corn How do you explain it? So, evening, sir. We're going to join. Specific thing is there anybody can answer? Yes, anybody yes. can answer. Oh, this looks like it. I think um, Saudi Arabia about four hours, while I take USA one hour. One hour? One hour, yeah. Right. So, so, Saudi Arabia has an absolute advantage in the production of oil because it only takes an hour to produce a barrel of oil compared to two hours in the United States. The United States has an absolute advantage in the production of corn. So what they're suggesting um, with this theory is that it makes sense for them to trade. So I'm better at producing oil, you're better at producing corn, might as well be just trade, participate in international trade. All right, and these are the simplistic examples just to, to give you a sense of what happens at international level in terms of international trade. 
where countries where they think about outside of joining the World Trade Organization. There are many times countries they um they they form regional blocks and it makes you know they form these regional blocks um with a particular intention or with a particular purpose and also to sometimes outside of regional blocks if they, they form trade agreements because it makes sense for them for example to say okay these countries have an absolute advantage in producing these particular goods and or services and there's a high demand for that for these things in my country and vice versa all right um so comparative advantage no um, and, and economy's ability to produce a particular good at, or service at a lower opportunity cost than its trading partners. Comparative advantage is used to explain why companies, countries, or individuals can benefit from trade. Because one of the weaknesses of, um, and I probably should have put some of the weaknesses in absolute advantage. Um, one of the major criticisms of absolute advantage is what if um, Saudi Arabia has an absolute advantage in producing both oil and corn, then of course, there's no need for them to trade with the United States and vice versa. If um, the United States has an absolute advantage in producing um, both oil and corn, then of course, it does not need to trade with um, Saudi Arabia. So in that instance, international trade would come to a standstill because the parties are not would not benefit from that. Um, so comparative advantage no, um, is used to, when used to describe international trade, comparative advantage refers to the products that a country can produce more cheaply or easily than other countries. So there are instances in which, um, so let's watch this clipping of comparative advantage before I go any further. So I want for you to watch and you're going to tell me specifically um what you understand from it in relation to why should you use Miro? comparative when you advantage draw on a whiteboard no one sees it with Miro, you can plan together in real hey how you doing econ students this is mr clifford welcome to acdc econ today i'm in hong kong china to talk to you about international trade and comparative advantage Everybody trades, and I'm not just talking about countries, I'm talking about everyone. When one person becomes a dentist, they trade their services to the person who's the lawyer. Since people don't have the time to learn how to do everything, and they have different abilities, they specialize in one thing and trade with other people for the thing that they need. And it's the same way for countries. In fact, Hong Kong is the international hub for finance and trade in all of Asia. It also has the fifth largest skyscraper in the world, the International Commerce Center. Let's look at a made-up scenario to show you why and how countries trade. Let's use the United States and China, and let's assume they can produce only two goods, planes and toys. Now, before we go any further, keep in mind that it doesn't really look like this in real life. Countries produce more than just two goods, but we simplify the world in economics, and then we bring in the complexities later on. Anyway, in our situation, let's just say the United States can produce 10,000 planes or 30,000 toys, and China can produce 4,000 planes or 20,000 toys. It's easy to organize this by drawing a grid with the countries on the left and the things they can produce on the top. Notice the United States can produce more of both planes and toys. This is called having an absolute advantage. But this doesn't mean that the United States should produce both planes and toys. Both the United States and China should specialize in producing one and then trade with the other country. But how should they trade? That guy just walked right through here. Oh, that's funny. To determine what they should produce, we have to calculate something called per unit opportunity cost. Okay, we know the United States gives up 30 toys when they produce 10 planes, but how many toys are given up when they produce just one plane? That's the per unit opportunity cost. The number of units you'd lose divided by the number of units you gain. So for the United States, one plane costs three toys, and each one toy costs one third of a plane. How many toys does China give up when they produce one plane? For China, one plane costs five toys. Now, how many planes do they give up when they produce one toy? The answer is one fifth of a plane. So which country should specialize in producing planes? The one that gives up three toys for each plane or the one that gives up five toys for each plane? Well, the US, because they have a lower opportunity cost and therefore a comparative advantage. China has a comparative advantage in the production of toys. So if these two countries specialize in 
trade, they'll actually be better off than if they try to produce the products themselves. And that's the whole reason why we learned the concept of comparative advantage. Hey, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Autograph? Okay. Let's look at the concept of terms of trade. All right, we so do we understand comparative advantage? Yes, sir. Yes? All right, so continuing the discussion. Um, so comparative advantage argues it is beneficial for two countries to trade even if one has absolute advantage in the production of all products. What matters is not the absolute cost of production, but the relative efficiency with which it can produce the product. Comparative advantage arises from national endowments, um, deliberate national policies are the collective acts of the firms in an industry. And these are, so what makes a, a country more comparative, um, having more comparative advantage are different things, national endowments, deliberate national policies. And of course, when we talk about national um, policies, we are talking about regulations and things like that, or the collective acts of the firms in an industry. In other words, how the firm, um, different firms operate within a particular country. So while often lacking the ability to produce a good more efficiently than other countries, comparative advantage implies a country has the ability to produce that good more efficiently than it does any other good. And I can a, a, a very easy example to think of is um, the United States, for example, and China. So America, the United States, for example, um, does have an absolute advantage in producing, um, as they said, for example, planes and toys right planes and toys but they look at it um but it might make a decision to say okay i am not going to focus on making toys because i can get a better return on making planes so in other words because it gives up on producing toys it would mean that they, that that is what is actually called the opportunity cost what they give up in order to gain so they say okay it's better for us to buy toys from China because China is able to produce that um, the toy at a much cheaper rate. All right. So here again, now we, we this kind of helps us to again understand um, comparative advantage. It applies to all goods and services. Um, it is the foundation principle of international trade. It provides the main justification for engaging in global trade. It supports global sustainability because it shows our countries can use scarce resources efficiently through international trade. And they give us an example. While Japan is good at making cars and smartphones, it is easily good at making um, cars. Thus, Japan concentrates its resources on making cars. Other countries such as China, um, and South Korea focus on making smartphones. In this way, Japan makes maximal use of its, res its resources by focusing on making cars and the world gets superior um, automobiles. So even though they can produce both um, goods, it makes better sense to focus on the one that you're, you're, you have a better advantage. Um, um, this is why compar it's, it's called comparative advantage. Comparative means that in, in comparison to what else I can produce. So it makes sense to just focus on what you can get a far more returns on in terms of international trade instead of trying to produce everything. Make sense? Yes. Sir. Yes. So com um, comparative advantage is contrasted with absolute advantage because absolute advantage just says that you should specialize um, in um, you should specialize and produce and export every and anything that you have an absolute advantage in versus comparative advantage that says no even when you have um, a comparative advantage in two specific um, goods or even goods and services it makes better sense to focus on the one that will give you the greater return and import the ones that um, another country can produce better than you all right so the summary of comparative advantage Comparative advantage is an economy's ability to produce a particular good or service at a lower opportunity cost than its trading partners. The theory of comparative advantage introduces opportunity costs, opportunity costs as a factor for analysis in choosing between different options for production. I'm sure you guys would have been introduced to um, opportunity costs. In have you guys done any um, economic course like macroeconom, microeconom? Yes, sir. 
Right, so you should be familiar with that term. Comparative advantage suggests that countries will engage in trade with one another, exporting the goods that they have a relative advantage in. There are downsides to focus only on countries' comparative advantages, which can exploit a country's labor and natural resources. In other words, for example, in Jamaica has, would say Jamaica, in relation to some of the other countries that have winter and all of that, Jamaica has a comparative advantage in being a tourist destination or the Caribbean generally. And because there are because there are so much resources. Um, there are so many resources focused on developing the tourism industry. Other areas uh, might get exploited. And the perfect example is when you see the discussion about the cockpit country and development. You know, like for example, a hotelier wants to go there and build a hotel, and Jamaica Jamaicans are saying, "No, no, no, no! You cannot um, abuse the natural resources." So you can think about it in, in terms of that as a, as a disadvantage. Um, absolute advantage refers to the uncontested superiority of a country to produce a particular good. And again, now what they're constantly doing is to kind of show you the difference between absolute advantage and comparative advantage. Um, the other theory now is cluster theory. And the word cluster means grouping. So I, I just think about a crew or um, a, a gang, a group a gang, a crew, a group, a group of individuals, a group of companies, a group of countries even. So it can be looked at as a kind of prescriptive or descriptive theory, and it was coined or developed by Mike, Michael Porter. Um, it focuses, it says that location plays a central role in global trade and making some companies and countries have a comp competitive advantage over others. So please remember now, comparative advantage is different from competitive advantage, and we're going to look at that. So competitive advantage refers to a company, economy, country, or individual's ability to provide a stronger value to consumers as compared with its competitors. It is similar to but distinct from comparative advantage. So let's just talk a little bit about competitive advantage. Um, so let's, let's do... All right, how many persons, all right, everybody in Jamaica, you either use Digicel or um, Flow. Let me ask different people. So Alre, which network do you use or which network do you prefer and why? Alre, I, you have two. Um, you're locked in on two instruments, so I'm, I, I assume you are able to talk. Okay. Um, which network I rather use? Yes, which network? Um, in terms of Digicel or uh, Flow? Yes. Um, I would say Digicel. Why? Um, why I would say Digicel is just because, um, and, you know, Flow that really pick up everywhere. Mm -hmm. Because back where I used to live, I used to have a flow um phone, you know, the signal not really the everywhere you have to go to certain places, you have to pull up the phone at a certain level, you know, to get the signal. Mm -hmm. So either with digital, you know, the signal reach out to a wide range, but it better than flow. In terms of the data connection now, um everybody of them choice, them preference, but I would choose the digital same way over the flow. Because with the digital, you know, you can get a long a longer lasting use than with the flow as a youth and just um you put on the service so, and you watch a couple of videos, the mega might get done. Mm -hmm. So therefore, all right, the digital and therefore the internet are also better than flow. So you know, I would say this I would stick to digital. All right. Um so what I'm hearing from you, and, and it fits within the definition, um, part of when we're talking about um, cluster theory and looking at competitive advantage is that, as this says, where a company, and let's talk about it at the company level now, is able to provide a stronger value to consumers in comparison to its competitors. So one thing you said, you said um, Digicel uh, provides a better value to you as a consumer because you're, a, you're able to use your phone island-wide. So the signal is available island-wide. And two, the data package is better because you're able to, to, to get uh, much more use, um, data usage um, versus flow 
And in comparison to connectivity, again, Digicel has better connectivity than internet connectivity than Flo. So there, so in other words, it, this is why, um, this is partly why Digicel has a competitive advantage over um, Flo. Do we understand that? Do we understand that? Could you repeat, yes, sir. please, sir? You want me to repeat all of that? No, 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 sir. I'm like the last thing I said. Right. I'm saying that the, in this case, Digicel would have a competitive advantage over Flow because of three things that were said by Alre. One, strongest um, signal, um, island wide signal. Two, longer data usage. And three, better internet connectivity. So that makes um, Digicel far more, have Digicel having a competitive advantage over um, Flow. Okay, okay, sir. So that's part of what the theory, the whole notion of cluster theory is about. It speaks to competitive advantage. Um, let me, so Kemar, um, in terms of KFC versus Burger King um, versus, let's say, Mothers versus, which other one is there? Popeyes. Which one is number one for you? Which one of the fast food outlets is number one or you, do you prefer? Um, is there a way for your sound to, to not sound so? Hey, that sound better? Uh, no. Oh, it's on. The echo? No, there's like some static thing in there. It just sounds like. Are you in a noisy background or it sounds a little bit? I'm not sure if you know how to. to um, to mute to, to do noise cancellation on your zoom no i can't try to find it hold on okay all right while you're doing that just mute your mic and i'll I, and i'll just ask someone else okay because it's right. really really noisy um kenya what about you i don't know if you eat fast food or you have a preference for any particular fast food outlet i have kfc burger king mothers Popeyes. which one do you prefer so which one do I prefer? Yeah. Or Popeyes. So you prefer Popeyes? Yes, sir. Which one would be number two? So I said KFC and what else? KFC, Mother's, Burger King. Um, KFC, Burger King, Mother's, Popeyes. Um, Burger King, sir. All right, so Burger King would be number two. All right, so... I'm going to ask you to compare now um, the why do you prefer Popeyes over all the others? Sir, I just think Popeyes fits my taste better mm -hmm. than the rest. Mm -hmm. So it's just the taste? Uh, yeah, the taste and the certain stuff that they offer there as well. Mm -hmm. What do they offer? Sir, I like that they offer um, cheesecake, like variety of cheesecake type desserts. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one. Um, yeah, that's that's really basically it. And I love their fries. I think their fries is the best. Okay. All right. So again, now we see why in her case, Popeyes has a competitive, competitive advantage over all the other um, fast food outlets. All right, before I go any further, I want to ensure that we do the presentation because time is going on and that part is fundamentally important. So let me just let me just um, share screen relating to the questions that we are going to discuss today. And then I'll hand over to the presenters. Um, I usually go like this. So let's take this off. We can finish this up. Where's my, I just opened the document, All right? So today we have Javar and Kemar presenting. Uh, I'm gonna ask Javar to go first, examine the roles of international bodies, the interna examine the roles international bodies play in international trade. All right, so Javar, the floor is now yours. Please have questions, comments, 
um, for his presentation. Everybody must ask at least one question, excluding the other presenter. It's, uh, give me a sec, please. All right, so good evening, everyone. Name is Javar Williams here, and tonight I'll be presenting on I'll, I'll be presenting on what uh, what information I get we examining the different roles international bodies play, and I'll be, I'll be presenting on World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. So. First of all, <clears throat> all right, so I gathered some info. So, read the history <clears throat> of the World Bank. The World Bank, originally known as the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, was established in 1944 and has since grown to include a collection of five closely related development organizations. Initially, its loans assisted in the reconstruction of nations disseminated by World War II. The bank group collaborates with national governments, the private sector, civil society organizations, regional development banks, think, tank, think tanks, and other international organizations on a variety of global issues, such as conflict resolution, food security, climate change, and trade, as well as issues relating to finance, agriculture, education, and most importantly, trade. All right, so. Why did the World Bank came into existence? So the World Bank was established to help rebuild Europe and Asian countries to help them recover after World War II because they were in need of funds to help with reconstruction of their countries. So additionally, in 1946, when it was first started, it had about 38 members, and today most nations in the world our members. Um, so, is there any questions thus far? Or no good? We're okay. All right, thanks. All right, so. Uh, yeah, so the purpose of the World Bank. So, the World Bank offers grants, interest-free credit, and loans with low interest rates. It concentrates on enhancing infrastructure, health, and education, the management of a nation's natural resources, agriculture, and finance industry are likewise modernized using funds. The stated goal of the bank is to bridge the economic gap between rich and poor countries, converting rich nation resources into poor country growth. So to achieve sustainable poverty reduction, which is the bank's long-term goal. So regarding the, the part that says uh, converting rich nation resources into Poor country growth. That, that would be like, like for example, I would say, like um, for example, the rich country would like, produce, say like for example, they produce, produce like cars. Just just an example. So I'm gonna like for example, like maybe they could bring a factory to the to the poor country. Um, they could give some some people some work so that they can earn and 
you know, then can give back to their country and help, help build up their country. This is, this is an example. Um, hope I came across. Hope I came across a little clear to you guys. All right. So the functions of the World Bank. To achieve this goal, the bank focuses on several areas. Sorry. All right, so what I have here is to encourage growth, to fight poverty, especially in Africa, aid in the reconstruction of nations recovering from war, which is the main reason for extreme poverty. Give middle-income nations a specialized solution to keep them out of poverty and to control global financial crisis and advance free trade. Any comments or questions, Esther? Or you guys catching a grasp of it? So, I have, a, I have a short video on some rules. Um, World Bank is involved with, with regards to international trade, and I'm going to play this video, and hopefully, yeah, it will. So, I'll go ahead. What are the roles of the World Bank? The World Bank is a group of financial organizations whose purpose is to develop member countries' economies and to reduce or eliminate poverty throughout the world. It is recognized internationally as the world's apex bank that is helping emerging markets and developing countries. What are the roles of the World Bank? In summary, its goal is to bridge the economic gap between rich and poor countries. The history of the World Bank highlights that goal. It was established by the 1944 Bretton Woods Conference following the devastation of World War II. European countries and others involved in the world were in dire need of rebuilding and reconstructing of their countries and economies. That brought about the idea of the first multilateral development bank in the world. How would the World Bank get funds to perform its roles and achieve its functions at the onset? The funds came through the sales of bonds. France was among the European countries that benefited from the loans. The bank continues to provide long-term loans for developmental projects and economic support spanning 5 to 20 years. Let's now get down to the main roles of the World Bank. From all that has been said earlier, the roles or functions of the World Bank can be categorized as follows. 1. It provides technical services and support to the member countries in various forms. It does this through the activities of its various affiliated financial organizations, Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency MIGA, International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes ICSID, and International Finance Corporation IFC, the Economic Development Institute and the World Bank of Staff College in Washington. The Economic Development Institute and the World Bank of Staff College in Washington were established mainly to help in providing such services. 2. It provides downloadable data on major economic indicators to advise about 200 member countries through the IBRD under IRD by analyzing the annual World Development Report. These indicators include climate change from the study of the environment and energy, health issues such as life expectancy, labor, income, and education, demographics, poverty, gender, and aid effectiveness, urban development and infrastructure, government economic policy and sovereign debt, business, agriculture, and financial. These and many more are found in publications such as the World Development Indicators and Global Development Finance, the Little Data Book, Little Green Data Book, and the World Bank Atlas. Three, it also grants loans to member countries to shore up their economy and aid infrastructural development. The bank determines the amount of loans and interest rates in addition to other terms and conditions applicable. It analyzes projects duly submitted to it by the country applying for the loan, such countries have to repay either in reserve currencies or in their currency. Still, on loan matters, the World Bank supports private investors from member countries on its own guarantee if the bank is convinced that the loan will be used to create jobs and facilitate economic growth. One key condition is that the private investor must get the approval and obtain a recommendation from those countries where the project will be executed. 
Yes, the World Bank has been criticized by economic activists. What do you think about the role of the World Bank and its discharge? Please let us know in the comment section below. All right, so I hope this video kind of gave you guys some clarity with regards to the World Bank and its roles in international trade. Any comments? Moving on. What? All right, so the rule read the rules continued. So the World Bank collaborates with governments to develop and put into effect policies that maximize competitiveness boost connectivity and facilitate trade in order to further improve trade. In line with twin goals of eradicating extreme poverty and increasing shared prosperity, the World Bank helps countries improve their access to developed country markets and enhance their participation in the world economy. All right, so that is it on World Bank. I'll be presenting on International Monetary Fund. All right, so a brief history on it. So the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, was established in 1994, sorry, 1944, after the Great Depression of the 1930s. 44 founding member countries sought to build a framework for international economic cooperation. Today, its membership embraces 190 countries with staff drawn from 150 nations. Also, the 190 nations who make up the IMF's nearly global membership are in charge of and responsible Oh, the organization. <clears throat> so, oh, is the International Monetary Fund finance? So, the majority of the IMS funding comes from the money that nations provide as quotas or capital subscriptions when they join. Each IMF member is given a quota based on our uh, based in great proportion, portion based on its place in the global economy. Also, when nations encounter financial difficulties, they can borrow from this pool or the money that they like pay down as yeah. All right, so facts about the IMF. So as stated before, the IMF was established in 1944. It has 190 member countries and 150 nationalities among staff and 24 executive directors representing 190 countries. So the purpose of the IMF the 190 nations that make up the International Monetary Fund strive for sustainable growth and prosperity in order to boost productivity, job creation, and economic well-being. It, accompl it accomplishes this by supporting economic policies that encourage monetary co cooperation, cooperation and financial stability. So what do they do? They, what they do? What do they do? <clears throat> the IMF has three crucial responsibilities. Advancing global monetary cooperation, promoting trade and economic growth, and discouraging unfavorable policies. IMF member nations collaborate 
with one another and with other international organizations to carry out these missions. Are there any questions? No, not yet. All right. Okay. All right. So, right here, I have an next video again regarding the International Monetary Fund. This guy put found what it is fund, and I hope it can also bring some clarity and yeah, iterate what was said and help you to better understand it and get a grasp of what is being presented. All right. So, I'm going ahead right now. What is the role of the IMF? The International Monetary Fund, IMF, is a global financial organization established in 1944 during the post-war economic revival drive. The main aim of the establishment is to manage exchange rates and to ensure a quick recovery from the economic devastation of the war. Almost all members of the United Nations are members of the IMF. But what is the role of the IMF per se? When the Brenton Woods Exchange Rates Management System was adopted, J.M. Keynes and Harry Dexter White played a very crucial role in the development of the system. The idea was, and still is, that stable exchange rates among the member states of the United Nations Organization, as the UN was then known, would increase standards of living. That goal automatically saddled the IMF with the following functions. Fostering international monetary cooperation among members. Promoting exchange rate stability helping to deal with and regulate the balance of payments adjustments, assisting during an economic crisis by providing distressed international coordination, including loans and advice. What IMF practically does. To perform the functions listed above, the organization in practice does the following. 1. Surveillance and monitoring global economic conditions. Because of the IMF's rare ability to review the past and preview the future of the economies of states, it could generate reports on each economy, pinpoint areas of weakness or possible danger, such as an unbalanced economy burdened with large current account deficit or excess debt levels. By keeping a tab on the pulse of each economy, IMF gives invaluable analytical reports such as the yearly World Economic Outlook, Global Financial Stability Report, and Fiscal Monitor. Number 2. Advises Member Countries the IMF usually suggests ways to avert the foreseen economic problem or how to come out of the current crisis. It has developed standards that members should follow under different circumstances. Provide soft loans to members with financial crises. From the members' contributions, application fees, and other revenues generated by the organization, the IMF has hundreds of billions of dollars as loanable funds. The organization may be willing to make such available loans to the needy as part of a financial readjustment. Over $180 billion of such loan has been arranged in bailout packages since 1997. Even powerful nations like the UK benefited from such loans in 1976 when the pound sterling was under pressure. Some $110 billion was granted to Greece in the 2010-11 economic year. Giving conditional loans slash structural adjustment. To prevent recklessness on the part of leaders, the IMF would usually insist that certain criteria be met. These may include tightening of monetary policy to reduce inflation, increasing tax to reduce the deficit, supply-side policies in form of privatization, deregulation and improved tax collection, removing price control to free the market forces interplay, removing barriers to ensure free trade, currency devaluation to reduce current account deficit, and so on. The roles of the IMF keep changing according to the scene of the world. This has become conspicuous since the 2008 global economic crisis when an IMF surveillance report hinted at the looming financial crises. But the world leaders regretted it and paid heavily for it. Thank you for watching this video and don't forget to subscribe, comment, and turn. All right. So, IMF is with uh, information built back it up also and the international monetary system, um, the mechanism by which payments between the nations are made internationally was established and is maintained by the IMF to encourage investment and the advanced balanced international trade. It also offers a structured framework for currency exchange activities. Okay, and with that, um, that is my presentation and 
I hope you guys learn something and yeah, thanks for listening. All right, thank you very much, Javar. Um, any question, comments before we go to the second presenter? Okay. All right, so I'll give you an overview and you're, everybody's going to learn my marking style now. So, so um, it's good that you chose two of two international bodies that um, are renowned and well-known and looking at some of their particular roles. So we get a very good, a very rich description of their roles. Um, the word is decimated. The word, I, I'm not sure, there's a word that you're trying to pronounce, the pronunciation is decimated. So we got a sense that the World Bank participated, um, we came to the fore after World War II and really participated um, in rebuilding some of the world's economies and that the International Monetary Fund um, also helps out. However, I have some concerns with the presentation and I, I'm going to try to be as nice as I can. So I felt that the presentation was very descriptive, but it was not critical. In other words, it lacked critical analysis. What I got was really a kind of historical or historicization of both of the organization, but I didn't see where it answered the question. So we got um, so there, the, the videos were there. One, I think the videos were too long. And then for me, in, in, the, in both instances, the videos kind of repeated what was already said. So the videos, and I don't think that everything that you say in a presentation must have a purpose. So I think that the videos were relevant, but they did not add any value because they, what was being said in the video was already said. Um, I, I, I think the presentation needed better clarity. So it was clear that you were looking at the IMF and the International Monetary Fund, but it was not clear in terms of how do these particular um, each contribute to um, or um, facilitate or foster international trade. I didn't see that part. Um, the videos, for example, so for example, I know that they, they, the World Bank works, for example, with the International Monetary Fund and World Trade Organization to deepen cooperation on trade-related services in, in particular countries. I know as well that the World Bank um, strengthens firms in developing countries and helps them to participate in international trade. So you needed to have a very clear, what I would call topic sentence or focus in terms of, okay, so I'm going to look at the World Bank and, and argue that um, that they do this, and this is what helps, and, and this is how they help to help countries participate in international trade. And then you give us specific examples. So, for example, in Jamaica or in this particular country. So there were actually no examples given for both um, con um, um, international organizations as it relates to international trade. Um, the other thing that I, I, I felt as I said, I didn't see any specific examples being used. And if I were you, instead of playing the videos that give us the long roles that they play, or what you could have done is, yes, these are the specific roles played by, for example, the World Bank. But for my presentation, I'm focusing on these two roles and talking about how um, these two roles played by the World Bank or the IMF um, facilitate international trade. So that was, that was absent. The same thing happened with the IMF. I felt that it was too descriptive and there wasn't any critical analysis. In other words, where was your voice in the presentation? I, I got a lot of information coming from all over the place. But you remember the information that you get from other sources are supposed to help you have a conversation about a particular topic. They're not supposed to have, you're not supposed to use them and, and you're, not, you're, you're not supposed to, the presentation should not just be about what they have said, but you're supposed to use sources to help you have a conversation on what you want to argue. So that was absent as well. Um, Right, so I felt that they, 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 there, was, there was a lot of description, which was very, very good, but I, I, I'm yet to see the link between the World Bank and international trade and the link between the IMF and international trade. I don't know if I'm a, a little bit too brutal, but I made um, notes and I, those things were absent. So I, I, I hope that you will improve on the quality of your paper. All right, so if I were you in terms of when I'm going to write my paper now, I look at, so I'm, I say World Bank, and I'm looking at these two roles in relation to national trade. IMF, these two roles in, respect, in regards to international trade. All right, so, and, I, and I'm just giving an overview 
because you're the first person to go and I want other people to get as well. You're not the first person. I think you're the second person um, for persons to understand really how to do a presentation. Um, okay. So thank you very much, um, Javar. All right, go ahead, Kemar. All right, sir, I understood. Yep. yep. Yes, sir. Just one second, yes, sir. All right, you see my screen, sir? Yes. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Kemar Murphy, your fellow classmate. Tonight, I will be presenting on the on World Trade Organization um, in international business, businesses that should be. All right. Why well, am I screen actually? All right. So behind the the World Trade WTO World Trade Organization, we will be looking um, deeply into some very interesting information that um, I had research and came up with, which would which would shed some light on what the WTO is about and some of the rules of the WTO. Right, all countries benefited from the WTO, both um, internationally and so on. So, so as I may start, according to the WTO, the birth of the the birth of the organization came to life, January 1, 1995, which was recognized as the largest international trade since World War. During that time, the GATT was already in existence. But the purpose of the GATT was to police the trades of goods among countries while the WTO agreements of trade in service, intellectual property, and the settlement of dispute. In addition, WTO has 164 members. They facilitate international trade through the movement of tariff and non-tariff buyers and the provision of greater market access to all nations. So um, this is just a summary of the history of the WTO, which is the World Trade Organization. All right, so now we are going to look at what is WTO. WTO, acronym for the word World Trade Organization, is the only international body that deals with the rules of trade between nations across the globe. The world, the WTO is a place where government officials meet to sort out problems that are faced among countries. These meetings are specific about nations' actions and not just about liberalizing trade. However, the rules that are enforced are to protect the consumers through the spread of viruses and the protection of the environment. So, um, as I said, what is WTO and basically a synopsis of they are not just about liberalizing trade, but we as consumers have to also be protected of what we consume, right? And further down, we will see we um, actually where nations um, that is benefited from the WTO can, because of free trade, will impact us as computer um, consumers in other parts of the world. All right, the objective of WTO. The objective of the World Trade Organization is to assist their members to improve standard of, standard of living, job creation, and improve people's life. The WTO operates as the police who enforces rules to assist countries that are less developed to improve on their trade capacity, also to remove trade. Um, treatments that is discriminatory between international trade and foster relationships. So, hence, we are going to look at some of the advantages and disadvantages um, as it relates to the World Trade Organization um, on international trade. So, firstly, the WTO put in place standard to reduce trade barriers and to apply the principle of non-discrimination right so it doesn't matter the country that you are from what what this point is actually pointing out 
maybe you are from a less developed country, but you wish to conduct business internationally, right? It is a said law that our said rule that actually govern the less developed country that also goes for the big international country because it is one rule that goes for one, it goes for all. Secondly, the reduction of tariffs to facilitate free trade among countries. Right? This is, as we all know, uh, because as this is a reduction on tariff, these are, sorry, one second, sir. Some nice next to our district. One second. Sorry about that class. Yeah, so the reduction of tariff to facilitate free trade among countries. All right, the disadvantages of the WTO and international trade. Free trade benefits um, developed countries rather than developing countries. What I'm actually saying here, the free trade benefits, um, as I mentioned earlier, right, um, benefits developed countries rather than developing countries. So developing countries, which is not um, that large as, for example, country like China, company, uh, countries like USA versus Caribbean countries, maybe like Haiti, Jamaica, or Cuba, you know, there is um, a disadvantage between, you know, the persons that are able to produce more to supply the need of um, consumers across the world. All right, so secondly, the offering of free trade continues to ignore environmental consideration. This means that countries that have the least amount of environmental protection are now able to export goods and our services to other parts of the world. This one, when I look at it, and um, it kind of draws, draws my attention because it really gives us something to think about, right? Because as, as I repeat, there are certain um, sentiments in this sentence right here. You know, it has some impact. Because it's a, the offering of free trade countries to ignore environmental consideration this means that countries that have the least amount of environmental protection and this is why um throughout countries you find different outbreaks of viruses because there are some restriction sometimes you would wonder how oh, some items left some country to reach into a next country right and then we the consumers are going to be affected so um, it is just only two disadvantage based on the essence of times. All right, three roles that are performed by the World Trade Organization, organization internationally. The first one we're going to look at is the tribunal. The WTO acts as a tribunal in the settlement of dispute among countries who play the role of trade tribunal. These complaints are oftentimes about other countries who is not willing to follow the policies and guidelines of the World Trade Organization. For the countries that are disputing, they should try to settle their differences by themselves. If they fail to come to some amicable solution, they will have to meet with the WTO to iron out their differences and the WTO will decide on a ruling if the ruling party does not comply with the finding of the WTO, a sanction may be applied by the WTO, right? Um, so these are what, what we're actually talking about here is different countries having their differences um, in as it relates to trade and so on. So some countries maybe stepping in the next country because of the policies that are in place. For example, we have the CARICOM, right? Um, which over, which would have said that basically is for the Caribbean, for the Caribbean countries, right? So if Jamaica maybe feel, felt offended by something that Trinidad maybe, that Trinidad actually do, then 
you know, there's a place to take it. And this is what the World Trade Organization is about with the 164 members, right? They oversee all those members and they are, it's an international body, you know, that deal with that specific type um, of situation. All right, secondly, I want to bring across an extra role that the international, the WTO plays is to, is monitor. When we're talking about monitor, the WTO acts as a monitor to review policies of the 164 members. This process is to ensure that these members are abiding by the rules of the WTO. The main purpose of monitoring is to ensure, is to measure the impact on their domestic policies, on their and on international trade. The purpose of monitoring is not designed to solve problem, but it but is to prevent unforeseen challenges from happening. Hence these um what this is simply saying to us here is that the purpose of monitoring is not is not designed to solve problem but is to prevent unforeseen challenges from happening so when you have someone closely monitoring you just like oh you may monitor a child what you are trying to do is to prevent the child from damaging themselves and this is exactly what the wto is doing um among the 164 members to ensure that these countries are being monitored right on a continual basis and so on to prevent unforeseen challenges that may arise. All right, thirdly, um, about training. Training um, in the WTO, right? So therefore, the WTO provides training program for government officials from developing countries across the globe. For example, ministry, staff, and custom officials. Training that are given is to better educate people about international trade, or to grow their economy by world standards of WTO principles and guidelines. What this is simply saying here, for the members, you have different, you have to continuous, um, continuously train them to ensure, and as it relates to what my fellow classmate has just presented as an example um about the um the imf as a perfect example the imf would visit jamaica on numerous occasions having these um, programs to ensure that jamaica you know is up to date as it relates to imf but on the other hand what we're talking about now is the wto who in a similar position provides training for its members to ensure that you know they are up to speed and they are living by the guidelines um so those are the three roles that actually um those are the three roles that the world trade organization those are three of the many roles sorry that the uh, world trade organization actually do all right, so conclusion to what was just um, said. But before I move on from here, is there any question about what was said prior to now? Or is there any um, era that you would like to, some light to be shed on? The question is out on the floor to anybody. All right, okay. So silent mean consent so i may um, proceed so in closing the wto is an international body that oversees policies and procedures of countries to ensure that they are meeting the required standard of international trade the wto is also a facilitator and a mediator who intervenes to settle dispute among countries they also provides a platform for countries to have access to trade smoothly and freely so in a summary, right, this is, in a nutshell, this is basically what the WTO, World Trade Organization, said so to do from the get-go. From the, from the first started, 
in January 1st. Uh, I don't quite remember the year. This is what they actually said so to do in a summary. All right, so now I have a video um, that will give you a more. All right, so, so pause because we have a few minutes and I want to comment on your presentation um, because I think you have concluded. So um, the video uh, is okay. I just want to comment on your presentation. We have five minutes and I just want to give an overview. All right. Okay, sir. All right. Um, so thanks very much for uh, for your presentation. Um, looking at World Trade Organization, um, I got a sense that there was some amount of thought that went into it. This was it had some level of critical analysis. So there was description, but there's but there was also critical analysis where I could hear you wanting to use some of the roles played by the World Trade Organization in responding to the question. Um, what I suggest you do in order to improve your paper is not to use hypothetical examples. If you do that in my paper, I will fail you. You have to get specific examples. So for example, when you say that World Trade Organization acts as a tribunal, you need a specific example. So you might say, for example, in 2020 or in when, when America or whatever country did this, the, 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 the World Trade Organization stepped in um, to, to, um, to iron out the issues between the countries. Um, you mentioned also in relation to, I think the second point I looked at was monitoring the compliance, the co let me call it compliance rate of countries as it relates to the rules and regulations of the World Trade Organization. Again, you need specific examples, no hypothetical example. When you're writing an academic paper or doing an academic presentation, your examples have to be uh, researched examples, not examples that you make up um, off the top of your head. Um, I like the fact that you had a range of roles of the World Trade Organization, but then you zoomed in on three specific ones that were that was actually very, very good. And I could see where you were linking it to international trade. But as I said before, what is important is that you get specific examples to support your claim. That is what makes your paper or your presentation academic versus editorial. Without it being properly researched, having actual document documented example or examples, um, it becomes an editorial. So, so it was a relatively good presentation. It just needs to be improved in certain areas. And what I'll do on Friday is to show everyone how to now move from presentation PowerPoint to actual academic paper in terms of writing the paper so that you can upload to turn it in. All right. Um, any questions, comments? No, sir. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Yes, sir.